Lately, the media's reputation has been under attack. Of course, we all know how former U.S. President Donald Trump feels about the media. Fake news. No. When you report fake news, which CNN does a lot, you are the enemy of the people. Go ahead. Likewise, President Joe Biden has also had his criticisms of journalists. That's a great asset. More inflation. What a stupid son of a But they're not alone. Even the average American doesn't hold a high opinion of the press. In short, the vast majority of the public believe the media is unscrupulous. Hi, I'm Professor Mark Robowski, and in this video lecture, I will address journalism ethics. I'll examine the reasons why the public distrusts the media and whether this criticism is justified. I'll also discuss some of the hot spots that raise ethical concerns for journalists, along with explaining ethical guidelines for journalists. First, let's begin with a little history. A big reason that the public is disappointed in the press is because they have high standards for journalists. In short, we've come to expect journalists to be accurate and objective in their reporting. But it wasn't always that way. The notion that journalists should be honest and fair is only about a century old. The early American press was partisan, biased, and often inaccurate. Events such as the Civil War and public backlash against dishonest journalism practices led to a transformation of the profession in America. The Civil War during the 1860s pitted northern states versus southern states, and newswire organizations such as the Associated Press sold their stories to newspapers in both regions. As a result, their reporters simply reported on who won battles in a neutral and factual manner rather than injecting pro-North or pro-South opinions into their coverage. This new approach gained momentum in the industry, but problems persisted. Around the beginning of the 1900s, two prominent newspaper publishers, Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst, had been engaged in a competition for readers and seemed to be willing to sell newspapers at any cost. For example, the United States entered into a war against Spain in 1898 that was arguably due to a fake news story that Hearst published in his newspapers. These unethical practices became known as yellow journalism. This led to a backlash, and there was a strong public push for accurate and fair reporting. In the 1920s, a media critic known as Walter Lippmann argued that this crisis in journalism was undermining democracy. He was particularly critical of the New York Times and published a scathing account of how its staff's bias had distorted the newspaper's coverage of the Russian Revolution. He said that journalists were more concerned with political narratives than with facts, that they were telling readers how they wished to see the world rather than how it actually was in reality. And this in turn was a disservice to the public, who were relying on the news media for information so that they could make informed decisions. It was sort of a real-life example of Plato's parable of the cave in that the public was prisoners of an illusion created by the media, and they would be shocked if they knew the truth. There was also a growing new problem facing journalism. Around this same time, propaganda began to be more fully understood and increasingly used by a developing new occupation called public relations. Lippmann worried about its impact on journalism. In short, the world was becoming a very complex place, and people were struggling to make sense of it all. So Lippmann and others argued for a new form of journalism that would rid the press of bias. He proposed having an objective press. What exactly does that mean? Objectivity basically means being neutral, unbiased, balanced, and without personal ideology and values and opinions. That said, we know that humans can't ever be completely unbiased and neutral. Our emotions, perceptions, relationships, and experiences get in the way and cloud our judgment. So Lippmann proposed using a method similar to the scientific method that would help journalists reduce their subjective views and instead present the news objectively. Being journalistically objective means doing things like talking to both sides in a controversy instead of presenting news in a one-sided way. It means identifying sources so that readers can judge whether they are credible instead of using anonymous sources. 
Objectivity also requires putting information within context and verifying facts. There's an old saying in journalism that if your mother says she loves you, verify it. That basically means journalists should never take any piece of information for granted or assume anything. They should always double check to ensure accuracy. So when we talk about journalistic objectivity, it's really a careful process of news gathering and reporting that helps reduce reporters' biases. Presenting news in this way allows readers to make their own judgments rather than being told what to think. In response to Lippmann's criticism and the public backlash against the press, journalists began to adopt codes of ethics to ensure better behavior. Principles such as objectivity, telling both sides of the story, and verifying rumors to ensure that they were actually true became standard journalism practice. But now, in the 21st century, many believe we are seeing a return to the old days of a partisan, biased, and unreliable press. A 2018 Gallup poll found that only 32% of Americans say the media is careful to separate fact from opinion, compared to nearly 60% in 1984. Almost half of Americans see a great deal of political bias in news coverage, up from 25% in 1989. And a majority couldn't name a source that reports news objectively. The trend appears to be getting worse by the day. Americans' confidence in newspapers and television news plummeted to an all-time low in 2022. According to a Gallup survey, only 16% of Americans have confidence in newspapers, and only 11% have confidence in television news. A 2022 survey of people in 40 nations found that media bias was perceived as a bigger problem in the United States than in any other country. Finland ranked highest with about 70% of its citizens confident in the Finnish media. But such significant distrust in the media is particularly concerning in the United States, where the press has always been considered essential to democracy. In fact, America's founders believed that a free and vigorous press was so vital to democracy that they wove it into America's social contract. The First Amendment of the Constitution guarantees press freedom and freedom of speech. U.S. Founding Father Thomas Jefferson said, the press is the best instrument for enlightening the mind of man. In fact, he added that if I had to choose between government without newspapers and newspapers without government, I wouldn't hesitate to choose the latter. The American press is often described as the fourth estate because it serves as a final check on democracy beyond the three government branches. It has an obligation to its moral claimants, who are the public, to put pressure on government officials and hold them accountable. It is journalists' duty to inform the public about how politicians are voting and spending their tax dollars so that they can decide whether to re-elect them when the next election rolls around. But most Americans don't think the press is fulfilling that role. A 2020 survey found that 84% of Americans believe the news media is critical for democracy, but only 28% believe the news media is fulfilling its role. The poll also found that 84% believe the press plays a role in creating political division in the United States. Now, in fairness to journalists, they're not entirely to blame for this negative perception. Part of the problem can also be attributed to a decline in media literacy among the public. There's often confusion over who's a journalist. Today's media consists of a diverse group of news outlets, including newspapers, TV and radio shows, and of course websites and bloggers and podcasters. Everything including tabloids, partisan news sites, gossip bloggers, infotainment websites, and even comedians get lumped in under the media umbrella, even though many of them don't identify as journalists, or they lack the standards of professional journalists. Studies show that many Americans, particularly younger Americans, can't distinguish fact from opinion. They can't even tell fake news from real news. Keep in mind that in America, anyone can be a journalist. You don't need a license to practice. And there are no laws requiring fairness and objectivity. At one point in time, there was a fairness doctrine, which required broadcast journalists to present both sides of a controversial issue.
but Congress eliminated that policy decades ago. So as news consumers, we must be careful to not demonize the entire media, which is a really broad group of people and organizations. And even at a specific news organization, such as the New York Times and Fox News, there are hundreds of journalists, and some are more committed to journalistic excellence and upholding high ethical standards than others. So we must avoid negatively stereotyping all journalists. That said, there are some troubling trends and patterns in the profession that can't be ignored. Bias can be seen in today's news coverage in many ways. First, simply communicating by written or spoken words introduces bias into news. Language cannot be neutral. It reflects and structures our ideologies and worldviews. For example, whether a journalist uses the term pro-life or anti-abortion, or whether they say undocumented migrant or illegal immigrant, is bound to anger some of the news consumers who may view their word choice as evidence of political bias. But most journalists do their jobs with little or no thought given to language theory, which is to say how language works and how humans use language. Second, there is structural bias baked into newsrooms. The press suffers from a lack of diversity in all forms, particularly racial, socioeconomic, and political diversity. Among today's journalists, nearly 80% are white, only 7% are conservative, and very few come from poor backgrounds, and a significant number live in one of three major cities. So this is a demographic that's completely unrepresentative of America. Can such a homogenous group of like-minded people adequately cover the diverse population of the United States? Beyond that, there is also commercial bias in journalism. The news media are money-making businesses. As such, they must deliver a product to their customers to make a profit. The customers of the news media are advertisers. The most important product the news media delivers to its customers are readers or viewers. Therefore, the media often engages in sensationalism, clickbaiting, and other practices to attract an audience. Topics like conflict, violence, and sex draw readers and viewers. Harmony is boring. One poll found that more than 80% of Americans think the media often sensationalizes stories and doesn't cover important topics that really matter. Relatedly, the media has a bad news bias. Good news is boring. This bias makes the world look a lot more dangerous than it really is. Plus, this bias makes politicians look far more crooked than they really are. Another example of this bias can be seen in shark attack stories. Shark attacks are rare, but there's so much news coverage about them that most people probably think it's a much bigger problem than it actually is. Another common form of bias in journalism is visual bias. Television news is especially prone to visual bias, but even newspapers and news websites are biased toward visual depictions of news. Television is nothing without pictures. Legitimate news that has no visual angle is likely to get little attention. Much of what is important in politics and policy cannot be photographed though, so it doesn't get adequately covered and explained. There's also expediency bias. Journalism is a competitive, deadline-driven profession. Reporters compete among themselves to break news first. In today's 24-7 news cycle, where stories are often first reported on social media, this can lead to journalists prioritizing getting the story first over getting it right. Some journalists figure they can always delete the tweet later if it turns out to be wrong. Even the most respected news organizations have been guilty of rushing stories to press before they adequately verified and fact-checked them. In some cases, this has not only resulted in story retractions, but also huge defamation lawsuits. Finally, journalism suffers from a narrative bias. The news media cover the news in terms of stories that must have a beginning, middle, and an end. 
In other words, a plot with antagonists and protagonists. Much of what happens in our world, however, is ambiguous. The news media apply a narrative structure to ambiguous events, suggesting that these events are easily understood and have clear cause and effect relationships. Good storytelling requires drama, and so this bias often leads to journalists to add or seek out drama for the sake of drama. Controversy creates drama. Lastly, narrative bias leads many journalists to create and then hang on to master narratives or set storylines with set characters who act in set ways. Once a master narrative has been set, it is very difficult to get journalists to see that their narrative is simply one way and not necessarily the correct or best way of viewing people and events. And now, on top of all these biases and making matters worse, many journalists are questioning whether they should still try to be objective. Many journalists believe they should take on more of an activist role instead of covering news in an impartial and balanced way. A 2022 poll by Pew Research Center found that 55% of journalists believe that when reporting the news, every side does not always deserve equal coverage. In contrast, 76% of Americans believe that journalists should always strive to give equal coverage. Journalists who favor abandoning the traditional approach of a balanced news coverage argue that some views shouldn't be amplified. As NYU journalism professor Jay Rosen observed, if we say the world is round, we won't feel obliged to find someone to argue the flat earth position. But other media critics, including me, contend that's a straw man fallacy. How often do journalists tackle a settled issue like the earth's shape? They practically never do. The biggest news stories usually involve controversies that reasonable people can disagree on and require difficult solutions. For example, experts have debated and flip-flopped on how to handle the coronavirus. Journalists undermine their search for the truth when they deprive their coverage of critics who ask different questions and make different background assumptions. Studies show that groupthink leads to poor problem solving. Conservatives and liberals alike can fall victim to motivated reasoning and confirmation bias. So what can be done to fix this problem? How can we make journalism more fair, neutral, and accurate so that it lives up to Walter Lippmann's vision? Unfortunately, there is no easy fix. New laws can't fix journalism. Government regulation would violate the First Amendment and could hinder the press's independence and watchdog role. Imagine if the president decided who could be a journalist or what constituted fake news. Donald Trump and Joe Biden would likely have very different opinions on what's legitimate news, and both would probably censor some truthful stories they don't like. With very few government regulations, the profession instead must rely on ethics to govern its own behavior. Many media outlets follow the code of ethics written by the Society of Professional Journalists. It's organized around four principles. The first and most important principle is to seek the truth and report it. Journalists should be honest, fair, objective, and accurate. This means that facts should be verified and based on solid evidence. Quotes from sources should be accurate and unaltered, and sources should be identified and attributed in stories. A truthful story should promote understanding, Given time and space constraints, the goal should be to provide an account that is essentially complete. Enough relevant information should be included as to preclude misunderstanding of either the facts or the context of the facts. The article should be fair and balanced, and it should be free of plagiarism and fabrication, which is to say, give other credits if you copy the words or use their ideas, and never ever make facts up. Lastly, journalists should try to avoid using deceptive news gathering practices to get information. The second principle is to minimize harm. Journalists must realize that they're covering human beings, so they should be respectful, tasteful, and sensitive. Note that the code says minimize harm, and this precept is ranked second behind telling the truth in terms of priority. Here's why. Journalists may not be able to completely avoid causing harm. 
If you're doing investigative reporting, for example, your story may expose corruption and cause someone to get fired. But in the end, the greater good will be served by your reporting. The third principle in the ethics code is to act independently. So don't accept gifts or favors or bribes. Your only obligation is to serve the public's interest. This is why it's so important to avoid conflicts of interest and avoid covering people and organizations that you may have a relationship with, either good or bad. Doing so would make it difficult to be objective, and even if we are objective, there will be a perception that we aren't. The final major principle of the Journalism Ethics Code is to be accountable. That means correct mistakes and expose unethical practices by journalists. Too many news organizations ignore unethical behavior inside their own newsroom, or they cover it up, which hurts the profession's credibility. For example, a troubling common practice is stealth editing, in which journalists change incorrect information in a news story on their website, but don't note the correction to readers. If these four ethical principles in the Society of Professional Journalists Code of Ethics sound familiar to you, it's because they are rooted in classical ethical frameworks. For example, the notion of truth being important is a well-established moral value that can be found in Greek philosophy, the Bible, and really just most ethical frameworks and religions. The precept to minimize harm is a bit utilitarian. You know, we should try to achieve the outcome that will bring the greatest good for the greatest number or inflict the least harm on the fewest people. You can also see John Stuart Mill's ideology reflected in the code. If you read the entire code, which goes into detail well beyond the summary I provided, it says that journalists should support the open and civil exchange of ideas, even views they find repugnant. Recall that Mill was a big supporter of the marketplace of ideas and strongly opposed censorship. Meanwhile, Immanuel Kant's philosophy can also be seen in the code. Kant emphasized that we need to treat people with dignity and as ends in themselves rather than as a means to an end. The Journalism Ethics Code similarly states that ethical journalism treats sources, subjects, colleagues, and members of the public as human beings deserving of respect. So the Society of Professional Journalists Code of Ethics is a carefully thought out set of ethical guidelines for professionals working in the media. And that's because the profession understands that its most valuable asset is its reputation. If the public distrusts the media to tell the truth and to be fair, they're going to stop listening to them and instead get their news elsewhere. However, as we all know, the ethical heights journalists set for themselves are not always reached which is one of the big reasons many legacy news outlets are hemorrhaging readers and viewers. But all in all, journalism is an honorable profession practiced for the most part by people trying to do the right thing. Having worked as a journalist for several years before I became a lawyer and journalism professor, I can tell you that most journalists, especially those outside the beltway, aren't evil. Most don't commit journalistic sins such as fabrication and plagiarism. Most want to get the facts right, but they may be understaffed or overworked. Deadline pressures can affect accuracy and judgment, and sometimes hairy situations are unavoidable. Being a journalist often involves a conflict between providing information the public wants or needs to know and respecting individuals' privacy. This isn't to excuse all of the media's problems. America's press is far from perfect but it is necessary for a successful democracy. As journalism professor Jonathan Peters observed, journalists write, draw, design, record, and make photos ensuring that freedom of thought is possible. Some are killed for it, others arrested. Most work hard to produce fair and accurate reports. Mistakes are made, too many of them, but a free and responsible press, however imperfect, is the lifeblood of a healthy democracy. That said, there's still plenty of room for improvement, and that's where the public comes in. The public has an important role to play in fixing the problem. Journalism is an institution, but it's also a business, as I mentioned. Ultimately, consumers will be the gatekeepers by deciding which stories get clicks and shares and which stories don't get attention. So be part of the solution, not the problem. Become media literate. Support good journalism. Well, this has been Professor Mark Rabowski, and thanks for watching.